Okay, good evening everybody. Um, welcome to the South Africa House. Um, for this evening to come and meet the back members, which you, you will have the, uh, the honor and the privilege of doing just shortly. Um, before we start, can I just ask everybody to switch their mobile phones off or to silence? Um, um, thank you. Um, okay, so for those who don't know me, my name is Simon Jones. I'm the CEO at Healthy Rhinos. Um, this evening's event is very much about um, celebrating the fact that we have two of the Black members, the world's first all-female tennis coaching unit with us here in London. Um, and as well as Hugh and Belinda, uh, we also have Craig Spencer, who is the founder of the Black Members, and he's going to be talking to us as well. So, another round of applause. So, um, as I said, for those who don't know me, my name is Simon Jones, I'm the CEO of Healthy Rhinos. Uh, this is our 10th anniversary year, um, and I'm delighted that, that this is actually the second time we have, we've been able to bring um, some black members over to the UK for a, a series of talks. So, um, I'm thrilled that they're here again and we can celebrate our 10 years. We've been working with the black members um, since we formed them and pretty much since they formed as well. Um, so, we've kind of own our journey of evolution over the last decade. Uh, and I won't steal that kind of like by sharing lots of stats now, but uh, I'm sure that many of you know that um, you know, rhino poaching has, has been a huge threat to the species um, across all parts of Africa, but particularly in South Africa, and particularly in the Kruger and the Glacier Kruger National Park, which is where the mammals operate. Uh, so, I think for me, having such an innovative approach to anti-poaching that we're going to hear about tonight um, has been an instrumental part in keeping and protecting rhinos safe within the areas of operation of the Black Mothers. Um, so I'm, I'm particularly excited to be able to have a chance to hear from them. I know many of you in the room have had the opportunity in the past to um, visit the Lule and to, yeah, to see cool. where the members operate. And for those that haven't, then I hope tonight will, will bring to life um, their whole operation a little bit more. Um, there are a few thank yous I just um, need to make. Firstly, thank you to um, the High Commission of South Africa for, for allowing us to use this room this evening. We put this event together in, in very short notice, and this was. Um, Is that better? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so, so, yeah, so, um, so, big thanks to the Commission for to use this, this space. It's a, it's a fantastic space, and, and we did put it together in very short notice. Um, a big thank you to the team um, from Helping Miners, um, Transfrontier Africa, and to Alice Plomart and her team from Hand Success. So, Alice is very much, has, has been instrumental in bringing the members over in this. And he's working them hard while they're here and making sure that lots of people get to hear their story, which is fantastic. So, big thank you um, to all of you. Uh, big thank you to um, the, the wine tasting, Herald Wine Cellar. Um, I don't know if any of you had the chance to see, we're going to move the table a little bit. So, if you're able to join us for half an hour or so after the, the talk here, then please do go and have a look at their wine tasting. Um, it's fantastic wine, they come from all from South Africa, so um, I'm sure you'll really enjoy that. Um, so I think uh, on that, um, I'm going to hand it over to Craig and then I'll come back up a little bit later on with Q to Belinda. Um, but I'm going to hand over to Craig first of all and let him start his talk. I'm going to come up there. So, yeah, guys, I know there's a lot of faces 
are debated and even our trust is taken pretty much for you guys being here. Uh, Amy, some of our research interns, I see, and then Mom are here. It's really, really awesome. So thank you very much for that. How do we show the video? Um, I don't have the remote. Uh, so, if you we 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 so, yeah, the other thank yous, uh, I think I'll keep for later, Alice, of course, thank you very much indeed, always been there for us from the beginning as well, been able to train the numbers from the start, etc. I think you probably want more in these days than you normally do on a patrol, actually, trying to get around London. So, without further ado, I think let's go into the video first as an introduction. Anyone carry on? It was a theory of hypothetical. You know, we knew that we couldn't turn the usual old rusty tools at the same old problem time and time again. You know, we knew that we were not going to shoot this problem away, it was been tried many times in the past, and we needed a sort of multi pronged strategy to address this, and something that's going to perpetuate in the future. We tried to create role models in the communities. So as children grow up, their only role model will be a coacher whose only skill set is dodging the law and carrying a gun killing all animals to get what he wants. That's not the role model that we're looking for. I want to be one of the protectors. I want to protect the wildlife. You can't fight for yourselves. You have to fight for them. You have to protect them. The animals in nature is our heritage. If people don't protect the animals, or are the black mamas that protect these animals. In New York, we can pull not heavy animals, not running only, but all the animals in the world. I felt that I need to do something. I have to take part protecting the animals. So when I started creating as a black mamba, I was so scared and my family was so scared. I'm going to be eaten by lions. Here they are. I hope if I go there, I never come back to see my kid and my family. Maybe I should just leave it. I said to myself, if I don't do it, who is going to do it? The animals that mm, do want to go to protect them, they can't protect themselves. So I have to take part in this and protect, save the animals. I see these animals as my kids because I'm protecting them. I'm a good man to them. Save it my kids. So my kids want to share mm, mother's love with this animal.
Yera from Panapol went to Hoonspray across the Kruger National Park. So for the first time ever, I am. <laughs> but the strange thing is, the soundtrack to that movie has got the music and the rain speaking. Yeah. And we can hear the music, but not the rain and stuff. We're not quite sure what happened, but um, we will explain that at this stage because we couldn't, couldn't hear it from the rain directors. So we'll talk about it a little bit later and cover that then. But, uh, but for now, Hand back to well, actually, before I hand back to Craig, what I should say is that the, the, one of the reasons that we are all here today, as well as just wanting to hear from the Black Mambas, is to actually announce the launch of a new Black Mamba Crime Prevention Unit, um, which um, I'm delighted that Helping Rhinos has been able to, to fund, um, and they are finishing off their training at the moment at Graph Code. So, so I'm, I'm thrilled that we, we can use this opportunity to. Um, to, to really announce that. And so tonight we'll be taking you through what the difference is between a crime prevention unit and an anti-poaching unit and why there's an important need for both. So uh, now I really will hand over Craig. Thank you very much, Simon. I hope uh, that most of you already got this question. Do I use my Most of you already know what the bear mounts are about and you've been following them for some time or you've visited them. Uh, down in the bush and what have you. The two sergeants will come up and answer some questions a little bit later. But I think what I really just wanted to demonstrate, uh, you know, we've got a window of opportunity now. We have been through 10 years of losing, I think we lost about 1,200 rhinos uh, per annum uh, at the height of the southern borders of South Africa. In our area, we were losing up to three, three and a half in a 24 hour cycle at the peak. 2017. So on a tapping off of it, COVID-19 bought us some time, it bought us a window of opportunity, the supply and demand chain was interrupted. In that gap, that 10-year investment that Simon Jones, the rest of us, Alice, Holly Budge, there's a whole bunch of us sitting around here, and particularly the Mambas that have patrolled relentlessly day and night without seeing their families for 21 days at a time, Christmas Day, New Year's Day, whatever day, 40 degrees Celsius, and just trying to paint a dire picture for you, but it is rough. That's an investment that's been made. Now, if we were to step back, which is what we normally do in an enforcement kind of model, we say we've solved the problem, the pressure is no longer there, let's move our resources elsewhere, then you've wasted 10 years of investment because it's just going to come back again, and when it comes back, it's coming back twice as hard. We've seen this. This rhino coaching is not new to us, this last. 10 years of persecution, we were hemorrhaging three and a half rhinos a day. It's not new. I've been in conservation for 26 years. This is the second time in a 26 year cycle that the rhinos were persecuted almost to the brink of extinction. And we, we relaxed in the time when the purchase focused their attention elsewhere. We relaxed and then came back and came back twice as hard, and it cost 10 times more to try and live it in the bud. Okay, so what I'm trying to impress upon everybody is that whilst we have this window opportunity, let us pounce, let us close the window on the poachers so when they come back banging on the door, we are the stronger party. Okay, that's that's the significant thing. Uh, yes, the big announcement tonight, we, we already have our 36 traditional Mamba model, which is already a, a proactive crime prevention model where we've tried to demilitarize, downscale the, the need for a militarized approach. Try, oh, here we go. Well done, Simon. <laughs> oh, all right. Speech bubbles. So if you, do, does this thing have a beam over? I mean, a later point of talk about it. On a basic X and Y. <laughs> <laughs> On the basic X and Y axis, if you look at the X axis here, the broadest base of the pyramid is where the mamba stand with their proactive interventions. Okay, they're the eyes and the ears, they gather information, they cover a huge amount of territory with their boots on the ground, walking vast distances, sweeping for snares, whatever it might be. And at night time, if you're of course a dangerous with the elephants and the lions careening around all over the show. Very similar to the bobbies on the beach. They're very visible, they in the public interface as well. Here is the gap that we need to fill. Okay, in the past it was a top-down approach, strategic management where myself and Colette and a few others sit and say you need to control here, you need to control there, this is where the threat's coming in, etc. 
in between is where we need to put our crime prevention model. On the y-axis is, I mean, you can call it the level of specialization. I'm going to use that word instead of specialism. <laughs> the, um, you know, the, the, the new unit that we're training is going through a different set of skills. Uh, it's, it's different service providers that are coming in to train them in, in different techniques, the use of technology, the analysis of data, the verification of information. So you can see how it escalates up the pyramid. By the time we receive that information, we can say there's no longer information, that's intelligence now, and we need to act on it. Okay, so here, the black numbers on the traditional patrols. It's like, to me, it's like any, we wait any, our research intern. Then he's sitting all the way in the back there. Okay, here's the good. So, just like any research project, monitoring is not research. Monitoring is gathering information on a routine, structured approach. If you detect something out of the ordinary, it might raise a red flag, and you will say, let me focus research onto that aspect. So you're monitoring water quality every day, or you're monitoring traffic flow every day. Suddenly, something comes up, and you say, let me research what is the causal factor of that. It's the same in law enforcement. A member walking on a patrol, or a body on the beat, or whatever you, walks past and got institutional knowledge of the area. So they go, Mrs. Jones, oh, Mrs. Jones, you know, I'm sorry, sorry. Mrs. Jones, <laughs> dropping his kids off at school. You know? <laughs> And then you go to this who normally drops to the bakery every Monday and what have you got on it. There's a vehicle I don't recognize. Never seen that vehicle there before. Or these boot tracks are not a ranger from a lodge. These are tracks I don't recognize before. It's part of our And so on. So that's the value of having great numbers, institutional knowledge, and so on. They escalate that further up the line. It gets verified. And then it gets escalated further up the line. We don't want to measure our success on the amount of coaches arrested and taken out of the community or neutralized is the terrible term that we used up. We want to measure our success on the amount of days that we have not lost an animal to coaches. That's where the success lies. We are here to protect the wildlife. Okay, not to put bodies in bags and to put breadwinners, fathers, husbands, etc. behind bars. That's the main thing. So, that's the, the model as it is, as it stands. Thank you, Simon, for the prompt. I got it, I got it, I got it, but you just relax. <laughs> so, here's a, um, I'm going to ask, cute. Come stand up here with me. But in there. So, now you don't need a microphone, you think I'll just pass this one, you can sing a patio of the audience. <laughs> I mean, it's very a little bit what you see here. So crime prevention is quite a, a, a broad suite of activities, and you know, every situation is going to be different. We want to make the, the I mean, we haven't got 100,000 numbers to deploy all over every landscape, but in the landscape where we are deployed, we just need to take the incentive away from the poacher, make it difficult, make it challenging for the poacher, increase the risks for the poacher, make it unprofitable for the poacher. If you imagine that anybody that does anything has a window of opportunity uh, to get their reward. It's a poacher's got a four hour window in the dead of night where he's not going to be detected. If he can't get his return on his investment, time, efforts, whatever, two or three times, he's going to go somewhere else. You know, and, and in law enforcement, we displace crime. We don't really ever get around to solving it too far to go. But we will displace that crime either to a different area that's a temporal displacement, or we will displace it into a different time bracket, a temporal, spatial displacement. I got it wrong earlier, it's the wine. And then we displace it to a different commodity. So that's normally what happens. When you run out of rhinos, you stop poaching penguins. When you run out of, um, what else they poaching? Lost eels, then you start going for the next thing. You run out of tigers, you go for lion boats. You know, so, so that's, how, that's how our criminal networks work. And I'm going to go back to planting cabbages, they're going to poach something else. We just want to displace them off our landscape, push them into a more risky arena where they're hijacking cars and it sounds horrible, you know, but something that the courts now have to deal with, that the police now have to deal with, if necessary, or and they just decide to, to stop doing that activity altogether. But the fact of the matter is that we haven't destabilized the community next door and we haven't had to 
putting those lives at risk by vilifying them in their communities, creating instability. What's happening here, ladies? Explain to me what's happening here. There were two terror blocks where we were sitting the night that is coming in and out of themselves. So we don't mind if someone is staying at the reserve or what you are searching any vehicle that is coming inside. The other picture there is near sweeping where we are preventing bushmeat poaching. We are sweeping for snare, removing the snare that can kill the elephants, the impalas and the other animals inside the reserve. Yeah, sharing knowledge with our communities. It's where we are going to turn local school to the community that we are coming from and we teach the children about the job that we are doing inside the reserve. So during the pandemic, a lot of people have lost their jobs. So we are going to the community and give them, in, we are working with 90 families that we are giving them food during the pandemic because they were not working. Thanks. And let us say, something of significance that I really want to bring to everybody's attention is the, the impact of snares. Okay, snaring is an indiscriminate way of killing an animal. When you put a wire trap out in the bush, your intention might be to catch, uh, let's say, an impala for meat. But there's no little sign written on that snare saying impalas only. So a black rhino walking into that snare is going to be caught and is going to die. Uh, that snare is a really thin piece of wire. The black rhino is a big thing. It will snap off the anchor is normally a tree and it will cut through the tendons and it will be dead or a cheetah or a wild dog or whatever it is. Snares are the indiscriminate killers, like the wall of death. The, uh, that's what they call the gill nets that drift through the oceans, especially when they break off the ships. You know, and the entire food chain is represented in a gill net. The small fish get stuck, the bigger predator fish come in after that, the albatrosses die down, the otters, the dolphins, the entire food chain is a terrific escape of, of death. And the same thing happens with the snare. So a coach is not going to put out one snare, he's going to put out hundreds of snares around a waterhole because he knows animals will have to approach that waterhole and they're going to get trapped. We lose more animals to snaring than we do to poachers' bullets. That is a fact. A poacher coming in to shoot a rhino is a very destructive person, but is a very selective person. So anybody that fishes here, any anglers, now we need this big bloody hole out there. But, <laughs> but it's the same argument when I was working in fishing compliance that we had against the spear fisherman versus the rock angler. The rock angler puts a hook in the water with a piece of bait on the end and has absolutely no idea what's happening underneath the water, whether an undersized fish, an out of season fish, or whatever it might be, might bite onto that. He pulls it in, he sees it's undersized, but the damage is done. You fling it back, it doesn't matter. No, uh, no. Uh, spear fisherman is selective, you can see, select his prey, and shoot it. If, you, if you're illegal, you're illegal. But the point I'm trying to make is we are underestimating the risk of snares, especially when the landscape gets too hot and that poacher leaves the landscape with 300 snakes set in the bush that nobody but he knows about. Landmines in Africa have exactly the same problem. 50 years later, those landmines are still lurking on the landscape, blowing up elephants and children and cattle and various other things. We find animals caught in snares that are so old from power lines, or what do you call it, ding, ding, the old telephone lines, that we took off the landscape 16 years ago. Yet that material is still lying in the bush, killing animals because they've been manufactured into snares. We know those snares are old, you can tell, because these ladies know exactly how to tell whether there are snares old. Yet it's still there. And in a time of drought, when an animal needs to get to that last little bit of grass under the tree, trips, it gets caught in that snare. They are terribly destructive. We need, we can't cover the vast landscape with and still do the fence controls, and still do the nighttime controls, and still check the camera traps, change the batteries, change the data cards, blah, blah, blah. They've only got a certain amount of time in their day, and it's cutting seriously into my drinking time. So we need to find, <laughs> where we need to have a specialist unit that is looking at the prevention of crime. It's too late when an animal has got a snare around its neck, and I must spend 75,000 rand of some donor's funding to get a helicopter in the sky and veterinarian down 
take that animal's uh, snail, stitch up the muscle fibers, and blah, 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 blah. But the wild animal, when you treat it in the wild, you don't get a second chance. So it's not like you can take it back to the vet to have the stitches removed later, or you can monitor its progress. You get that one chance. You can dart it, you can fix it, but then you must let it go. And it might be in Zimbabwe, it mustn't be tomorrow. So anyway, the risks are huge for the wild animals. Blah, blah, blah. Pandemic, very important. Why is it important? Because a hungry family. This is a socio-economic problem that we're dealing with. Poaching is not a chosen um, lifestyle because it's cruel. You know, it's a hard job, and it's a tough job, and it's a risky job. Okay? We identified, well, the numbers identified 90 families in the three target communities and made sure that their basic needs were met with a little bit of extra happiness every now and again, and some sweets and chips for the kids, and vegetables to plant in their gardens, and so on and so on. Made sure they had basic needs met on a regular basis so they did not become the poachers. But whilst these guys, who are specialists in their field, of doing this, or this, or this and that, the patrols and the disruption on the landscape is not happening for the spear fisherman, the, the poacher, what do you call it, the rhino poacher. That's why we needed a special unit that just focuses on the three points. It's just didn't have something. Spared out. What's this? Very cute. Okay, this is some where Bushmen poachers went to the bush and put the air mask. So we find this this reported poacher kitchen where the poacher have already killed the animals and then they are trying to make a burrito because it's a thing to carry that meat well, it's not a burrito. So they try to make a burrito and carry the meat. And if a person can sneak into a reserve and set some snares, it's a high risk for us because if they saw a rhino, tomorrow will come back to push that rhino. So that's why we need to go in the bush and see that there are people coming in to set up some, some snares or not. Yeah, thanks, kid. I'm going to tell you a funny story, anecdotal, but it's true. Many moons ago, when I moved up to the bush, I was first in fisheries by Blind Street areas. We then moved up to the bush to get out of the guns and the bombs and the helicopters and things we to try and cleanse so out our soul. And the, the elephant poaching on the border stood at 96 elephants a day who were being poached for their ivory. So I got involved was to end up in Stanton and save the elephants. Okay. We calculated, myself and the other wardens in the Greater Kruger National Park, which is the Swiss bank account for these animals, by the way, in South Sahara, Africa. The Swiss bank account is a huge Kalahari desert that separates the, the elephant herds of northern Botswana and Zambia and Namibia, I tell you. Mozambique and so on, they're going to draw from the Swiss bank accounts to recalculate their box. It's a long, thin, skinny little park called the Kruger National Park, 60 kilometers wide at its widest point of okay? And that's the last stronghold for these free range animals. At 96 a day, when they did the, the Great Elephant Census, I don't know if you guys remember that, it was, it was funded by a number of organizations, and so here you go, and the great guys. 48% of all the elephants counted across the border were carcasses. We calculated that we had 220 days of elephants left if that came into the national park. Whilst we were discussing this, and Captain Morgan was lending us a little bit of inspiration, the first rhino was shot on the landscape. Our entire anti-poaching capabilities was a young man on a bicycle named Derek Nisi. He had a walkie-talkie, and the knocky is this thing with a knob in. That was it. We were caught with our pants down. Totally with our pants down. And we decided we have to address this. We can't allow this to happen again. We thought, oh my goodness, here we go. You know, you just know. If you've been in the industry long enough, you know where you find the first one. And every bullet you hear at night after that is another dead rhino. We had more rhinos than we had elephants. We had 22,000 white rhinos in the Kruger National Park which were, by the way, brought back in because there were none after the last poaching event that had to be reintroduced. 20,000 rhinos, we had 18,000 elephants. Now it's difficult to find a rhino in shoes because their behavior is very difficult. They're different to an elephant. It's very easy to find a herd of elephants and take 10 or 12 down at a time. Okay, so 
don't see this as a single species event, but I can promise you, I made this statement many times the egg and all over the ship, if we lose the battles, the rhinos, we've lost the battle for everything because we've created a false economy, a different set of values in a community akin to the Robin Hood ethos. Okay? We've destabilized communities, we've trained up vast squads of anti machine people with, with machine guns and paramilitary, blah blah blah. We just caused we've just lost it. The moral and the social decay in those communities has uh, just been too much. And it was sorry Simon, I'm having a rant because it's very close to my heart. My schnulls run so fast, but my heart. Okay, so the crime prevention unit um, yeah we actually here tonight to celebrate the fact that we've what what you want to am I right there? Eh? Okay. <laughs> Simon Cowell is sitting over there. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> the, the new crime prevention unit is currently in training. They've, they've been in training for four or five weeks. This is their fifth week now. Uh, we'll evaluate them at the end of their six weeks and then we'll decide whether they're ready for their next level or whether they must stay on the course for a bit longer. It's a unique training that we've already had to put in a skill set from a number of different organizations that are a little bit out of the box. People that have never heard of before, the technology guys all the way from Holland. We've got specialist trackers that have come in. We've got people doing all kinds of training that I've never been through in my life, and none of us have. So they're doing a different set of training. Plus they're going to do the, the original paramilitary training that the members did. You can see some of them standing here, some of the new ladies. The process, we need six young ladies. The short list of the advertisement was 200 names. It took six months for us to go through the process. This must be a very transparent process in the community. We don't headhunt people. We go to the tribal authority, the monarch, and we ask his office, can you please select six young women that fit this profile? And they go about their business, and they come back, and they say, these are the 200 <laughs> and then we go through the shortlisting process, the screening process, the, the selection process is quite rigorous, it includes a lot of fitness, PT, psychosomatics, and including honesty verification, we call it. You know, so there might be somebody who has uh, tried to infiltrate the national park by signing up as a ranger, and they quite happily volunteer themselves for the honesty verification, basically polygraphs and bank accounts, checks and that sort of thing. So by the time we get to Freud, you must know that this is going to be quite a crack squad. Uh, it's all been right, thank you very much, that has put this on the map, something that we discussed a while ago, and finally got it off the ground, thanks to the funding from Helping Riders in particular. Buddy Budge from How Many Elephants has also thrown a vehicle at us, called a Margaret Thatcher's Revenge, because it's an ancient old ever, but I'm joking, that <laughs> We like it. <laughs> so this is just so photographs that have been taken during the training process. So it's, it's very hard, tactical, paramilitary stuff, but there's also got to be a, a, a theoretical component and an academic component to it as well. These are hot shots. These, these aren't these might, uh, no, I call it every, what it might be. These young women might end up in front of a magistrate giving evidence in court one day. They might be asked to write statements that are going to go into dockets. They need to have this skill set. They need to be trackers, uh, you know, expert witnesses. Write an A1 statement for anybody that's worked in the South African legal system. Articulate themselves as well. Crime prevention. Do we have volume? Yeah, we've got one. Is there practicing the parade?
Yeah, yeah thanks, Dad. Good, Dad. I guess he's sending my text to me now. She's a good instructor, so the numbers are a very, very important part of the training. This is our fifth intake, am I right? Where we've grown the team. Although, the first time we're doing the kind of this is normal number training, they, they all go through this, but it's really impressive for me to see that within the first, what was this, two weeks in? Really early, really two weeks in. The selection process is critical. Otherwise, that's going to be six weeks to get to this level. Okay, and the fitness when we did the International Ranger Challenge, this team beat everyone. They came third globally after four weeks of training.
But let me start. Is it um, cute as you've got the microphone first? Is this the first time you've been out of South Africa? No, it's not just that. Where, where have you been to before? Into the UK? I went to Belgium, into Belgium. Into Belgium, I went to Belgium. Okay, and Belinda, how about you? It's not the first time also I went to Belgium. Okay, so what, what, you, what were you doing in Belgium? Was that? Yeah, there was a women's conference where we empowered each other and took up about the job that we were doing in different departments. Okay, and so, okay, so, so this is your second time? Yes. Uh, South Africa. Okay. So, what, um, how did you feel like when you've been selected? How about your, your family? How did, how did they feel about you coming over to, to the UK? They were happy for us because it is our second trip, and in our family, no one wants to go all the outside. They stay in South Africa all the time. So, I put them on a map by traveling to the and are you sending lots of photos back home? Sorry. Are you sending lots of photos back home? Yeah, I'm sending the photos back home and I'm putting them on Facebook. And <laughs> 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 My friends are friends and my colleagues also are putting my photos on Facebook so that they can see that I'm, I'm not allowed them out of the country. <laughs> uh, you're having to, and, and, and Q, do you, what are your, your colleagues back there? The members are they uh, are they envious of you being here? No, they are not jealous. <laughs> they are impressed because this is always what we are doing. If there is opportunity in the members, there are some members who have been selected to go and represent us. So they are interested because I'm representing them here. Okay, good. And then, then, then how how long have you been a black man before? It's 2014, now it's been eight years. Eight years. And what was it that made you want to sign up to be a black member in the first place? I look at our country, unemployment in South Africa is too high. We are only focusing on tourism and other cars. So I had all this kind of coaching and sort of stuff. So I told myself that no, I must choose to go and protect those animals. Because I am a mother. My son wanted to be a ranger when he grew up. So if I don't protect those those wild animals, my dreams are not come true. So I'm doing this for my future generation. You said it was your son, right? Yes. How old is your son? Seventeen years. Seventeen? Yes. Okay. And you just have one son? No, I have two kids. And Belinda? I've got one kid. Okay. And, and how long have you been a black member? It is, we joined together. You both joined together? Yes. Okay. And you're both on the creepy, right? Yeah. Okay. So now I know that many people in the audience have have had the opportunity to to visit Bulule, and go to Kuru National Park and have uh, had a chance to see you and your, your fellow Batmaners in the operation, but I'm sure there are some who haven't either. So maybe can you just share with us what is a, a typical day for you? When you are on control of life. Okay, as a black mama at the coaching unit, uh, what we are exactly doing for protecting the wildlife? We are making the Baluri Nature Reserve the hardest place to push. We don't wait for the coaches to come in so that we can arrest them. We just wait them to get to chase them away. Okay, so we we'll put the boots on the ground, we we'll wake up early in the morning and check the fence. We we'll check if the fence has been cut at the night. We we'll check if there's an animal that's go underneath the fence and go outside the reserve. And we we'll also do the snare shooting where we we'll remove the, the snare that the potters have been set. And we we'll also go to the town local school where we we'll teach the children about the importance of environment. That is why we keep on protecting. And the knowledge that we are giving to the children, they took their children to their parents, their fathers and uncles, because they're the ones that are going to the reserve to coach. To the, the children that are telling them to stop coaching the animals because it's our heritage. So you're, you're, also, you're working in, 
in a place that is very dangerous. Uh, it's very dangerous because there are approaches there. But even when that approach is the way you're operating, it's very dangerous. Uh, and actually, I, I experienced this in, in February when I, when I was out with you. Firstly, uh, I saw, got to see firsthand the importance of your steel patrols. Uh, when there was a phone call came through, and I think a number of you were uh, on patrol and found a uh, kudu, which is a uh, fairly large answer, and they've been caught in a snare. So, I said it's quite an experience for me. Cutting through bush, listening to different groups of members communicating with each other in what could only be described as bird calls, so that they didn't give anything away. Um, and, and I'm pleased that we did manage to release the kudu from the snare, and then follow morning I was uh, to really highlight how dangerous it is, I guess. I was out with Craig and there had been a report of a buffalo that had been killed overnight. So we, uh, Craig was very keen that we went to examine the buffalo uh, because buffalo can easily be mistaken in the, in the night for a rhino. And, and maybe that's to see, was it, did it look like it was a poaching attack or wrong where they killed a buffalo instead of a rhino. So we got out of the vehicle, Craig's dog was, was running around and we were just starting to inspect it to see if there was any bullet holes. Um, and at that point, 10 meters away from us in the bush, we saw like, a big male lion which had killed the said buffalo and then started to eat it. So it really hit home to me how dangerous it is. So I, I just wondered whether you've got any other sort of examples where you've been out in the bush and something, let's be honest, scary had happened um, and then you could share with us. So 
we we did an excellent hand, excellent land where we were sitting to the direction where we spent this area. So there was two there was two coaches. The other one was sleeping and the other one being high on the bush and busy cooking. So we saw that coach before he saw us. So we will go straight to, to him and try to take a knife. Immediately so I to take a knife and try to stab one of my colleagues. Like we want to go to the patrol, we don't carry guns, we carry a paper spray and a hand cut. So we took that paper spray and spray his eyes and I need to see. And the other one, if he had us that we were making some noise, he wake up and tried to fight and we paper spray and we called for backup and they came fast and arrest those coaches. Who needs the guns when you've got pepper spray? <laughs> um, okay, thank you. Um, Craig, I just want to quickly ask you as well, because you know, we've heard about the threats to wildlife encroachments, but it's not just the wildlife, it's a big threat from encroachments to, to people out working with threats in the wild. Yeah, this is um, one of the primary reasons why we, I think we need to change our approach uh, where we're placing currently the model is to place the life of the animal over the life of the people. So it's really difficult to justify that um, when these ladies go back home to their community or whatever the coaching unit might be. Uh, you've got to consider the fact that their children are going to the same schools, they're shopping in the same shops, they're living, and, and a kinship model in the tribe has actually been broken. So you're putting these people's lives seriously in jeopardy. Plus, you're expecting of them to do the dirty work. You know, so the perception is that you go out there and you, you protect things and we'll just come and enjoy it in the luxury of a fancy lodge every now and again. And it's okay, go home, you're respectable. You know, that has got to change. I say this now because something that was a very really close colleague and supporter and mentor to the Black Bambas, Anton Mzimba, you would have read into the newspapers. He is the brother of one of our senior mothers, one of our senior soldiers, in fact. And he was gunned down in his house recently whilst our mother was at home as well. Life and death, and death is, is easy, life is cheap uh, in Africa. If we're going to keep fighting fire with fire, and if we keep going to try and shoot the problem away, we are actually just creating instability. I cannot live forever. <laughs> you know? And these ladies cannot be expected, and no other antipodian can be expected to march up and down the fences every day and night, stopping people coming in and chasing them around and pepper spray. We, we have to find an alternative solution. And, it, and how attractive is the job going to be to somebody who cares about wildlife if it becomes a militant, militarized uh, arena? It's going to become more attractive to somebody who is keen on flashy lights, a Belgian Malinois strap to a chest and a pair of night vision goggles jumping under a helicopter with a freaking 762 double stack magazine and an AK-47. That's who you're going to start attracting to wear the conservation uniforms. Okay? No longer are we going to have the field render that sits and takes photographs of the elephants and shows it to his kids. You need to stop. I think, I, think I, think it's very, um, I think it's very important that we realise you know, the importance of that, the importance of, uh, the importance of, of, of having conservation and having people come into conservation and the links to the local community um, and, and having conservation in local communities work hand in hand, side by side, um, which I guess very briefly because we are running horribly over, but, but, but just briefly because we couldn't hear from the way. Do you want to just quickly tell us a little bit about the Bush Basin program and the, the positive impact that has on even on the black members of their patrols? Yeah, thanks Simon. That's actually one of the, um, the projects that the Helping Rhinos initiated quite a long time ago. If you're evaluating the success of any project, you have objectives that you're trying to achieve. Okay, then you need to research it and gather data to be independently done. So that's what bias you know, to try and demonstrate whether you are achieving your objectives or not. The, the push back is environmental education is a catchphrase, everybody uses it all over the show. So to uh, be cautious though, because you could end up just dancing on a stage and entertaining a bunch of kids every day. Are you imparting knowledge? 
Is it changing opinions? Is it changing values? Is it changing behavior? How do you, how do you measure that? I mean, we say the mothers have become role models in the community. Oh, there's all fantastic catchphrases. We need to measure that. We need to see, as managers, investing other people's money, you know, we have a huge obligation to say, okay, we, we, we failed here, but we succeeded there. We need to put more effort into that or change that or whatever it is. And the Bush Babies model started really small, and it's interesting. The, the woman that runs this Lee Wayne, you saw her uh, lip syncing up there. <laughs> it's hilarious. I'm going to tell you the minute this thing is over, you can hear it. Uh, you know, she came to me as a young student from the Twani University of Technology with an anti conservation diploma of three years. She needed to do one year practical. She said, You're welcome to do it with the black numbers, but I cannot afford to pay. Okay? Unfortunately, it's not in the budget. She worked for a year to get the experience. In that time, she wanted to set up an environmental education. So people are doing ad hoc. These things need continuity, they need consistency, and they need continual evaluation as well. They need proper structure to them, they need a long term vision and what have you. And she came up with these plans. She started the Black Mambas. And to this day, she runs the, I mean, not the Black Mambas, they're called Bush Babies. And she runs the Bush Babies day and night. She lives in those communities. She wakes up every morning for me. She's got a team. So every member, uh, tactical and coaching unit that we deploy on the landscape sacrifices one of their team members to be a member of the Bush Babies educators. Okay, it's now sitting at 10 primary schools, and there's a thousand three hundred kids, almost almost two thousand kids now actually, that is engaged with both the Scouts program and the and I think when the pandemic hit, I know I'm rambling, there was a huge uh, challenge to us. The schools were closed. That is a lot of children that usually get a meal a day and have got no longer access to the education. I was sitting at home where you know, potentially things could be going wrong for them. And, and we've lost for two years the pandemic went on. We've invested in them for eight. You know, Simon, it's your money and everybody else's money sitting here. Now, after two years, those kids have moved on and they're not too old for the Bush Baby program when they come back to school. Or we've lost it. What a waste of an investment, you know, all of that time. So we built the resource center, the, 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 the tribal authority gave us the land, whatever. We built the center, how many elephants paid for the solar panels, and it linked us up to the global community with internet, which was a huge challenge, because we had satellite dishes and who knows what else to get the freaking internet working there. Put the ball balls in, grew the vegetable gardens, and the entire Bush Babies program operated from there, and all the kids came to the school. How did they get to the school? Donkey cars. So what do we have to do next? Find tires for donkey cars, get veterinarians out to fix donkeys, buy bridles for donkeys. So you have to see how this is a matrix of things you can You know, as any conservationist, you can't do snapshots. You can't think it's got to be proper structure in place, proper vision, from the top down, from the bottom up, you know, source to mouth. And I'm so proud to sit here amongst all of these people and these guys driving the Land Rovers through those communities with boxes and boxes of food falling off the back and no spoon to tie them on. I mean, those are challenging days. We dropped off energy saving stones. And this is all the Bush Baby Project. Strengthen the community, show the community that we're not just working to save the animals and forgetting about you guys down there. We've got a bond. When they see this uniform coming, I don't want them to run and hide and close their shutters. You know, and not have you take their kids and hide them away. I want them to come out and celebrate as they do when we have a tribal function. They ask for the numbers to be present. It's building allies to stabilize the landscape. I wish you were here actually. So you, you, you Next time. Us. Next time. <laughs> you really wouldn't. <laughs> okay, I think it's a perfect moment to, um, to, to end on, Greg. So I think for both Craig, Cute, and Belinda, it's good to have a big Okay, I said there'd be one more, like one more up here. Um, so I'm going to leave this up for a minute. This basically, oh, actually, if Craig moves his head slightly. <laughs> <laughs> we can do the cure. <laughs> 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 you said we would take your phone on the QR code. This will take you to a Mac Manders CPU page on our website, and there's a donate button there. Um, and it's very simple, and that will help to keep the, keep the, uh, the Manders CPU operational beyond just the, you know, this year and beyond. Um, as I said, there are lots of ways we can help parts with your money. 
um, and some slides. But, uh, but please do stay around. We've got another sort of 25 minutes or so, so please do stay around and enjoy it. Um, the drinks that are out there, very cute and Melinda will be out there. So if you've got any questions, um, then please do have, take the opportunity to have a chat to them, ask some questions. And, uh, but most of all, thank you very much for coming. Um, I do know this event we put together at very short notice, um, so it's fantastic to see so many people who have given up your Thursday night to be here with us. Um, but before I, I leave the stage, well, I'm going to leave the stage and come immediately back with Jill, who's going to help you. Thank you, Jill. We have a small gift for you for coming to London. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'll show you what it is, so you can see, because I think they're quite cool. And you also have a helping line of this water bottle. One of them to pray, you also get a water bottle. Hey. And keep your water cold. It might also be nice to do with that. And it's also And so we keep catching more as well. So thank you again so much for, uh, for, for coming over and being with us tonight and sharing your stories with us. And uh, we'll, we'll carry on outside. Thank you.